Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to the Q2 2024 update on what's next in OpenShift, we, where we give you a glimpse into the product roadmap, direction, initiatives, and exciting new use cases and features that we'll be delivering over the next 16 to 18 months. This is an hour long presentation that covers the summary and motivation of the roadmap. Additional details on each of the topics are covered more and can be found in the appendix. Please note that material covered here is subject to change. Next slide, please. I'm Kirsten Newcomer. With me today, I have this terrific team of OpenShift product management colleagues who will join me as speakers. In addition, we have the rest of the OpenShift PM team available to help answer questions. You may have noticed we're using a new tool, Kaltura, for this session. Please use the Q&A for questions and comments. To access Q&A, click on the live stage icon on the upper right of your screen. Note that your question won't be visible until there's a response. Red Hatters, please check the calendar invite for additional communication channels. Finally, I just want most of the features we're working on are heavily influenced by our customers. Let's get started. Next slide. For organizations that run their businesses on software, which is almost every organization these days, the quality and speed of delivery of those software solutions are key to the organization's success especially in the emerging age of AI. Almost every facet of our daily life nowadays is touched by software applications. Think about how many apps you're going to use today. We use them for almost everything, banking, insurance, shopping, travel, streaming movies, car ownership. Everything has been turned into a subscription managed by apps. More than ever, your software strategy is your business strategy. The ability to roll out new and improved digital business, business services and products continuously will be the difference between companies that stagnate and ones that evolve. Next slide. Of course, agility, hoping we'll get them, here we go. Of course, agility and new technologies come with challenges, such as those you see here. Some of those challenges have been with us for some time, such as app modernization and developer productivity. Some challenges are new or are increasing. 2024 is predicted to be the year of intentional AI, where AI is on the fast track to becoming ubiquitous at home, at work, everywhere in between. Even with few technical skills, Red Hat customers and employees are now using AI to create content and develop tools. Gartner predicts that 80% of enterprises will have deployed generative AI-enabled apps by 2026. The sudden increase of acceleration of AI increases the knowledge gaps and adoption gaps that developers must address, right? So this puts even more pressure on developer productivity. It also modifies the threat landscape. However, recommendations for securing infrastructure and application supply chains generally apply equally well across all types of solutions, including AI platforms and AI-enabled applications. However, organizations still struggle to update existing tool chains and processes, in part le leading to what we see as this incredible increase in supply chain attacks. Next slide, please. You need an application platform that is trusted, comprehensive, and consistent, whether you're running in the cloud, on premises, or at the edge, and at maybe many flavors of the edge. Our roadmap is heavily influenced by our customers. And in 2024, we're focused on these three key areas. Management at scale across data center, public cloud and edge. We want to help you with multi-cluster management and governance, cloud services, and all flavors of edge. Modernizing applications. Our goals here 
help improve developer productivity, enable AI development and deployment and running of AI and ML applications, simplifying app connectivity, and modernize infrastructure, help you bring VMs to a cloud-native platform with OpenShift virtualization, make it easier to procure and deploy OpenShift with hardware appliances like Dell Apex and HPE GreenLake, and modernizing OpenStack deployments with OpenStack services on OpenShift. Finally, security is a thread throughout all of these key investment areas. We continue to invest in security in platform, application, and supply chain security. Let's dive in. Next slide. Okay, and next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, awesome. So for developer productivity, we got, sorry, we had a lag there. So if you could go back one, that would be awesome. Um, 2024 app services and developer launches. So these are the range of investments we're making to help with developer productivity. IT organizations face challenges in modernizing their apps, ensuring that their developers are productive, securing the software supply chain, and now figuring out how to leverage the AI, leverage AI to drive innovation. So the details here cover how we enable engineers to address these talent challenges by providing tools and capabilities that help them build and modernize apps more efficiently, increase productivity with both the inner and outer loop solutions that address both inner and outer loop development, help the ops teams ensure that applications and infrastructure are secure, and adopt AI in existing apps. A few notable releases, release highlights. JBoss EAP was released in December 2023. The Quarkus community is added support for AI and Langchain, and the upcoming release of our next gen API management and application connectivity solution. In addition, when we look at developer services, we continue to invest in Developer Hub, our backstage, uh, productized backstage solution, also Podman Desktop, making it easier for uh, the developers to work on their local desktop and having an experience that simplifies moving from the desktop to OpenShift. We also have been investing in the tr in a trusted software supply chain with some new solutions currently in tech preview, the trusted profile analyzer and the trusted artifact signer kind of collectively these capabilities are known as our trusted application pipeline. Next slide, please. A little bit more about Trusted Profile Analyzer and Trusted Artifact Signer. We've been talking about DevSecOps for quite some years now at Red Hat. Uh, we increased our investment in DevSecOps when we acquired StackRox and delivered Red Hat Advanced Cluster Security, which allowed you to integrate security scanning in your CI CD pipeline, both for known vulnerabilities as well as for app misconfigurations. We're now shifting security even further left with the Trusted Profile Analyzer, giving you information about open source projects very early in the selection process so that you can find the best open source that fits your need. Trusted Profile Analyzer has a set of open source projects with uh, SBOMs, Software Bill of Materials, for each of those projects. projects. Known vulnerability data, as well as uh, information that you can leverage in the IDE. The Trusted Artifact Signer uh, can be used throughout the pipeline to help you do easy signing of all artifacts produced and it enhances the ability already available with signing of Tekton task runs, OpenShift pipeline task runs. And here I'm going to hand off to Ju. Thank you, Kirsten. All right, let's talk a little bit about AI and OpenShift. 
We continue to deliver innovative solutions that enable organizations to accelerate and streamline the development, deployment, and management of AI-enabled applications and Gen AI across private data centers, cloud, and edge environments. We're looking to add support uh, for GPUs in OpenShift sandbox containers via peer ports, so customers will have an isolated environment to run compute intensive workloads in the public cloud. To secure AI workloads, we continue to invest in confidential containers so customers can protect their sensitive data in the cloud. On the GPU front, we're working to add support to NVIDIA's NPS service to enable GPU serve uh, sharing so you can slice up GPUs to more efficiently use your GPUs for workloads, such as batch processing for small jobs, because NPS allows batch jobs to efficiently process in parallel for small to medium-sized workloads. We recently added support for NVIDIA NIM microservices to help enterprises more easily integrate Gen AI models into their applications, and we continue to optimize these capabilities for security, compliance, and controls. We're also going to add pre-compiled NVIDIA GPU drivers to make it quicker to deploy GPU nodes. In addition to NVIDIA, we continue our AI hardware enablement to include newer chips from AMD, Intel, and more. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. Oh, no, the previous slide, sorry. All right. Um, OpenShift AI is our AI-focused solution for enabling full lifecycle of AI ML experiments and models. In the upcoming releases, we're focused on four key areas that you see right here. In ML Ops, we're focused on enabling model training, experimentation, and model serving, as well as ensuring you'll be able to deploy your models to the edge with single node OpenShift and Red Hat device edge. On the Gen AI front, we're looking to add support for LL M serving and tuning, enhanced job and quota management capabilities, along with distributed workloads integration with the data science pipelines. For model development, we're planning IDE integrations and an end-to-end -end feature store that organizations can use for offline training and online inferencing to make it easier to manage the data sets and data pipelines. For platforms and integrations, we're continuing to add support for newer GPUs from AMD, Intel, NVIDIA, as well as add support for fractional GPUs. Lastly, we're working on integrating OpenShift AI with Red Hat Developer Hub to help you build a trusted and secure application pipeline with OpenShift. Next slide. So the virtualization market is going through a lot of changes right now, and we're seeing an increased demand for OpenShift virtualization industry. OpenShift virtualization is a cloud-native platform that provides customers a way to enhance their VM capabilities just by migrating them to the platform. VMs instantly benefit from cloud-native capabilities, such as automation and monitoring that can be used for VMs and containers alike. OpenShift virtualization already supports some dynamic configurations, and in the upcoming releases, we'll be adding the ability to hot add both CPU and memory to the VM. We're also helping customers to further increase their workload identity, I'm sorry, their workload density by adding support for memory overcommit to the CPU overcommit we already have. Networking requirements usually vary per case, per use case per customer. We keep adding capabilities to OV and Kubernetes secondary networks to provide solutions to the various requirements. One of the major enhancements we're planning to add is IPAM or IP address management to enable customers to assign and manage IPs of VMs and other pods on the overlay networks. Other enhancements we're planning include egress and self-managed overlay network definitions. DR is a really important pro uh, topic for stateful applications like VMs, and in upcoming releases, we'll be adding support for both Metro DR and Metro DR, I'm sorry, Regional DR for VMs with Advanced Cluster Management or ACM and OpenShift Data Foundation. 
Many customers are looking to run some or all of their VMs in the public cloud, and we're getting a lot of requests to support both OpenShift virtualizations and all hyperscalers. AWS and Red Hat manage OpenShift on AWS or Rosa is already supported, and in the coming uh, months, we're planning to also add Oracle Cloud support as well. And we're working with additional cloud providers, and we hope to announce support for additional cloud soon. Next slide. Let's take a look at how we're working to package to combine Ansible and OpenShift virtualization to not only make migrations of VMs easy, but also to handle all the infrastructure around it. Initially, we evaluate the existing data center setup, identify the scope of VMs, compute, storage, and network infrastructure that require migrations. Uh, Red Hat Consulting, along with Ansible Automation, plays a crucial role in providing visibility and preparing systems for migration, especially where hardware changes and multi-team coordination are involved. The migration itself is automated and orchestrated with the Migration Toolkit for Virtualization, or MTV, supported by Ansible for handling multiple VMs or clusters, integrating with ITSM tools. Post-migration, we enter a steady state where day two operations for host VMs, such as configuration management, application deployment, and event-driven automation are performed using Ansible Automation Platform, whereas OpenShift Virtualization handles hosting and integrating application workflows into their existing OpenShift tools, allowing VMs and containers to run side by side in the same platform. And let me pass you to Bala to talk to you about Red Hat Cloud Services. Thanks, Thank you. you. Hello, everyone. In this section, we will review uh, upcoming features in Red Hat Cloud Services. On Azure, uh, ARO will deliver two key projects to increase security and achieve multi-cloud parity for managed OpenShift cloud services. The first one is managed identities and workload identities that will utilize the short-term credentials and more granular permissions for the cluster operators. The second one is hosted control planes, where the control plane component would be hosted in the service account, uh, reducing the infrastructure cost for the customers. Azure Logbox will be enhanced to include SSH and kubectl access for SRE, again, improving the security posture. Multiple public IPs per load balancer API is already available under preview that will be promoted to GA status. Cluster-wide proxy can be configured on an existing cluster. We will expand regional availability, Taiwan, and uh, include more instances, particularly ARM-based instances, and also working on increasing the maximum cluster size. On AWS, ROSA will provide the ability to create hosted control plane clusters without OpenShift's default OVN plugin, allowing for customers to bring their own plug, uh, container network plugin and have it run it on ROSA. ROSA with HCP cluster API server access will be uh, available from another account through AWS private link without requiring VPC attachment to the cluster's VPC. This will help reduce the easy to transfer cost and also enable uh, accessing the API server from other accounts within the organization. We will increase the scalability of ROSA HCP clusters to 500 nodes. Similarly, ROSA Classic cluster scalability will be increased to 250 nodes. Customers will be able to create a ROSA with HCP clusters without requiring public internet egress access. So the, this will improve the security posture for companies that are particular about it. ROSA HCP clusters will support uh, ARM-based uh, AWS Graviton instance types. We recently launched a Terraform provider for ROSA HCP. The same provider will be enhanced to support all the above features in the next quarter. Next slide, please. Next slide, next slide please.
sorry, the previous one, I think we missed. Uh... Okay, thank you. Uh, on GCP, OpenShift Dedicated will introduce private service connect support for SRD access of the cluster API server. Private clusters are already possible on OSD. Supporting private service connect will also improve the security posture when SRE is accessed to support the cluster. OSD will leverage workload identity federation in place of uh, long-lived credentials for OSD operators that access the GCP APIs, again, increasing the security posture of the cluster. OSD will soon be available in additional regions, including Milan, Madrid, Saudi Arabia, Turin, Doha, and Chile. OSD will also in include support for standard instance types like E2, N2, C2, and M3. OSD also will include support for GPU-enabled A2 instances. Next slide, please. Thank you. Finally, in the cloud services, let's quickly discuss where we are with the ACS and where we are heading in Q2 and early second half 2024. So we had the announcement of the launch and general availability uh, in uh, for, for ACS. We launched a 60-day no-cost trial in last September. In, in this May, we will be launching general availability of the solution out there uh, during around Red Hat Summit. So continuing on from the general availability announcement, we will include the compliance uh, to make sure uh, the next half of the 2024, customers would get all the compliance requirements for able to use the ACS. Now I will hand it over to my colleague, Jamie, to walk us through workloads and developer experience announcements. Thank you, Bella. Let's talk about builds. Uh, next slide. All right, builds on OpenShift based on Shipwright is an evolution of the build capabilities that were introduced into OpenShift a decade ago. Going forward, we'll be enhancing the user experience of builds for how rel entitlements get used during build image builds, the installation experiences, as well as the CLI. We'll also provide guidance for customers on how to migrate from build configs to Shipwright builds. Although Docker files, uh, source to image, and cloud native build packs are popular ways to build images, there, there are other tools such as Kaneko. And we'll look to expand the build tools available to customers with the same consistent experience that OpenShift provides today. In addition, building multi arch images is an area that we'll be focused on, on, on initially with Builda and later with cloud native build packs. For cloud native build packs, we're also working to release UVI based build packs by Red Hat for Java Quarkus and Node.js later this year. Next slide. Okay, for Quay, there are two new developments we're excited about. First is the concept of referrers, which is part of the updated OCI spec in 1.1. This allows us to model a concept where artifacts like S-bombs, cosine signatures, or in toto attestations can, be, can, can point to the images they describe. Uh, this is a powerful uh, underpinning of a secure supply chain because it allows to easily discover if an image is signed or has an S-bomb attached when using mirroring tools or the register UI. We're also excited about keyless authentication. We're working on a concept where users and service accounts on OpenShift can transparently authenticate Quay using OICD. This alleviates the need to create and distribute pull secrets upfront for private repos and improves productivity, pro improves developer productivity by allowing devs to get started quickly. It also improves security because we are no long we no longer need to pass around static secrets, which need to be need to be man manually rotated then. Next slide. Now let's talk about the operator frameworks, NextGen UX. To better, to better ensure trusted employments, operators will clearly annotate 
the specific infrastructure features they work with. Their subscription requirements will be clearly defined, making sure users can stay compliant with licensing agreements. To provide comprehensive management, we'll offer a new centralized hub for managing a wider operator ecosystem, including Helm charts for streamlined deployments. The catalog will provide detailed insights into oper operator versions, updates, and deprecation information to help you make informed decisions about which operators to install and when to update them. Finally, the next-gen OLM fosters consistent rollouts with its declarative approach. This means that the desired state can be automated with GitOps to ensure reliable deployments. The next-gen OLM also empowers you with granular control over updates, allowing you to keep operators updated with security fixes without breaking changes. Next slide. Now let's talk about Service Mesh. Fresh off of our 2.5 release, the team is working towards a major update of OpenShift Service Mesh version 3 that will be based directly on community Istio rather than the current midstream Maestro project. We anticipate this to become technology preview mid-year and generally available late this year. In parallel, Service Mesh integrations across the platform continue to grow, the most notable being next generation, the next generation of OpenShift Ingress, which, is, uh, which will support Gateway API and is based on the Istio Ingress. Finally, as the uh, complexity uh, and diversity of our customers' environments continues to grow, we'll be expanding Service Mesh's multi-cluster support to include Istio's multi-primary and primary remote configurations, while continuing to work on longer-term features such as dual-stack support and support for off-Kubernetes workloads. Next slide. Turning to GitOps, where OpenShift GitOps uh, recently released their 1.12 version last month, uh, much more is on the way. And some of the highlights that are coming up are uh, the fact that the GitOps team is evolving Argo CD's signature verification capabilities with a new proposal called source verification policies. This will enable Argo CD to verify more than just GPG signatures so that we will be able to bring support for ver verification with tools like SigStore in the future. Next, soon to be general available is Argo rollouts. Rollouts combines blue-green or canary deployments uh, with the ability to perform analysis on those deployments and trigger automated rollbacks at the first sign of a problem. Finally, we recently released a tech preview of GitOps on MicroShift. We're currently working with our customers to refine and improve this initial offering so that we can make it GA later this year. Next slide. Now to OpenShift pipelines. Looking ahead, we're excited about the Red Hat TechTog catalog's general availability. It'll offer a vetted collection of tasks and pipelines improving reliability and reducing pipeline errors. We're also enhancing Tecton chains by introducing same defaults to simplify adoption. And we're also working on uh, an integration with uh, Red Hat Trusted Artifact Signer, uh, which will also simplify, which will further uh, streamline workflows around supply, software supply chain security. We're also enhancing pipelines as code, which will include triggering pipeline runs via chat ops commands introducing a custom resolver service and advancing concurrency control. Additionally, we're introducing, uh, we're introducing caching capabilities with step actions in Tecton, launching pipelines as pipelines and adding a manual, uh, custom, uh, a manual approval custom task with the, with the uh, console integration. Finally, we're extending Tecton support to Windows nodes, enhancing Tecton performance with high availability and refining multi-cluster Tecton with pipelines as code. Uh, next slide. Uh, finally, for serverless, OpenShift serverless simplifies application development by abstracting away uh, infrastructure concerns. And to continue that, we're prioritizing security with end-to-end -end encryption for both internal and external service, as well as auth-n and auth-z. Uh, serverless functions and eventing integrations are being uh, streamlined to make it easier, easier than ever to build event-driven applications. Uh, Python for AI templates will be available soon within serverless functions allowing you to jumpstart your model creation. Uh, we're also introducing Wasm integrations as a dev, pre as a dev preview feature for portable functions, uh, or, or, or for portable functions that can run across uh, ver uh, various set of architectures. And uh, coming soon, the GA of serviceless logic enables low-code, no-code orchestration of services and events, empowering a wider range of, developer, of developers to build powerful applications. Finally, OpenShift Serverless for Edge and ARM will, will uh, be available 
uh, providing efficient serverless computing while also ensuring uh, scalability and responsiveness of your applications. Uh, thanks everyone. I'll now turn it back to Jude to talk more about Quer platforms. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, next slide, please. All right, um, for the core platform, let's start with OpenShift onboarding and lifecycle, where we're focused on installation updates and provider integration. We continue to expand our support for new cloud providers and platforms, onboarding new regions and instance types, adding support for different architectures and enabling third-party in provider integrations. We're working towards expanding our support for hosted controlled planes for newer providers like Azure, as well as optimizing Red Hat OpenShift on AWS or Rosa, Bare Metal, and OpenShift virtualization. We continue working to add more flexibility to the install experience and, en and enabling OpenShift across different clouds, different architectures to enhance flexibility while providing a consistent experience. We're also planning to ensure that the OpenShift update experience is stable and consistent. And this is something we're working on continuously throughout the cluster lifecycle across different architectures and across different cloud providers. Notable features we're working on include Zstream rollback, improving the update experience with more meaningful and actionable insights, improving the update experience for disconnected and air gap deployments, as well as OC mirror enhancements for Enclave support, as well as support for various architectures. Now let's take a look at what else is coming. Next slide. So on the cloud provider front, uh, let's start with AWS. You'll soon be able to use IAM instance profiles while deploying OpenShift on AWS. We're also working to enable you to deploy full stack automated OpenShift on AWS or Azure using your own DNS service. We're also working to allow you to configure IPv4 subnets to customize the internal OVN networks or bring your own VPC deployments on AWS. Um, we're also looking to add IPv6 and IPv4 dual stack support across AWS, GCP, and Azure. For tokenized auth enable enablement on OLM managed operators on cloud providers, we'll continue enablement for select operators on Azure as well as AWS. And then we're also going to add support for GCP workload identity. For GCP, we're going to add support for um, deploying OpenShift on shared VPCs to place DNS management in a third separate service project. And we'll also be planning to promote to GA the ability to configure custom tags to infrastructure op objects managed by OpenShift as well as allow a user to use a private and restricted GCP API endpoints while deploying OpenShift. On Azure, besides being able to use your own DNS service when you deploy OpenShift on Azure, you'll soon be able to use NAT gateway objects from Azure to manage outbound traffic from OpenShift. We're also planning to add support for in-place migration to Azure AD workload identity, as well as Azure file CSI cloning. On the Oracle Cloud front, we're working with Oracle to make OpenShift available across the Oracle Cloud portfolio. And this includes um, supporting VMs, bare metal, um, private cloud appliance, and so on. And for customers looking to modernize their infrastructure with OpenShift virtualization, they can look forward to being able to do this soon in Oracle Cloud. Next slide, please. <coughs> Now let's take a look at what's planned on for on-premises providers. Um, key highlights we're planning for bare metal includes various day two configuration capabilities, such as modifying BMC address, attaching non-bootable ISOs, and simplifying adding nodes on day two. We're also adding tooling to make it easier for partners to create OpenShift appliances. On the vSphere front, um, the focus is on resiliency with features like adding support for multi V centers, servers in an OpenShift cluster and control plane machine sets for vSphere. We're also adding more configuration capabilities at install time. So you'll soon have the ability to set custom tags to machines or static IPs for VMs 
as well as making it easier to add nodes on day two for vSphere. Uh, for Nutanix, besides static IP addressing support and simplified workflows for adding nodes, uh, we're making it easier to dis uh, for you to do disconnected or air gap deployments on Nutanix and are working to make SDN to OVNK migrations easier as well. Uh, we're also planning to add support for Nutanix Flow virtual networking. Um, on the OpenStack front, we're continuing to invest in Red Hat OpenStack services on OpenShift or OSO. And so OSO is our next generation form factor with the control plane natively hosted on OpenShift and the external RHEL-based data plane is still is managed via Ansible automation platform. As part of the new OSO architecture, we're working to orchestrate OpenStack resources across multiple OpenStack clouds. We're also planning to introduce the ability to host multiple OpenStack um, control planes or multiple environments on the same OpenShift infrastructure cluster to offer better consolidation and grouping of your resources. On the IBM uh, side, we'll soon have PowerVS support via IPI and more enablement for hosted control planes. We'll also have SMCD and SMCR enablement for Z and Linux One. Next slide, please. Um, let's take a look at hosted control planes and um, the other portions of the core open shift. So for hosted control planes, and I'll call it HCP, um, we're planning to um, make self-managed HCP available on AWS, as well as a preview on Azure. We're planning to add support for additional mixed architectures for HCP, including ARM control plane with x86 data plane on AWS. We also be uh, we're also planning to automate etcd snapshots with HCP and add CSI RWX block and snapshot support for host control planes on OpenShift virtualization. Now for RHEL Core OS, we're working or we're continuing to work on providing an on-cluster Arcos build option to allow you to host your build environments in the cluster, as well as add, adding features and automation to make customized Arcos experience similar to the fully managed experience. We're also working to bring customization support to boot images for a number of hardware support scenarios. To minimize workload dis disruption, we're planning on a node maintenance mode. We're providing a way to define node disruption and having a pod priority based graceful sh node shutdown ability as well. We're also looking to add an in-place pod update and in-place vertical pod auto scaler update to eliminate the need to reschedule or restart the pod or its containers. And to better align with the Kubernetes community, we're working towards adopting cluster API within OpenShift, which includes migrating machine API to cluster API. On the storage front, we continue to enhance our container storage interface and core storage capabilities to provide unified storage across the hybrid cloud. And um, we're planning to, to add a SIF CSI driver for provisioning SIFs or Samba shares, volume group snapshots to allow users to take crash consistent snapshots of multiple volumes together, as well as Azure file CSI cloning and max vSphere snapshots for volume configuration support. On the auto scaling front, we're planning to optimize the cluster auto scaler to leverage least waste expander and priority expander configurations to help you reduce costs for scale out and scale in operations. We're also planning to offer an alternative to cluster auto scaling via Carpenter for scaling nodes in AWS, Azure, and GCP. We're also looking to add multi dimensional pod auto scale or MPAs, which lets you dynamically adjust pod replicas based on multiple metrics. Next slide, please. Continuing on the core platform, uh, we're continuing to invest in increasing the scalability and resilience for self-managed OpenShift clusters. To this end, we'll be adding support for cluster hibernation for up to six months, working to improve recoverability of the control plane with control plane recovery on expired certs. Um, we're going to GA backup API with automated backup of the etcd database. 
And we're also planning to promote to GA optimizations for enabling scalable and resilient stretch control plane deployments include um, selectable etcd latency profiles, selectable etcd database sizes, and adding support for four node and five node control planes for bare metal clusters, and adding support for external KMS provider for self-managed OpenShift. Next slide, please. To enable zero trust, we continue to invest in security by focusing on improvements in managing identity, integrity, and isolation. And some of our upcoming security-related features include bring your own identity um, so you can authenticate users and groups directly with Kubernetes API server. Uh, we're going to make this available on Red Hat OpenShift service on AWS or Rosa with hosted control planes, followed by Azure, uh, Red Hat OpenShift, or Arrow with hosted control planes, as well as self-managed standalone OpenShift deployments. We're also enabling secure workloads deployments on OpenShift with least privilege approach that's aligned with the Kubernetes community's restricted pods security standards. We plan to promote restricted enforcement to GA in an upcoming release. On the user namespace front, we're ensuring that if a container needs to run with privileges and the process escapes, that the not be privileged. We'll be adding KubeKMS support to encrypt data in its CD. And we already have this supported in hosted control planes, but now we're looking to bring this to OpenShift standalone and other related offerings. For CERT Manager, key enhancements include integration with OpenShift Service Mesh, support for additional issuers, OpenShift Route, and Gateway API support with CERT Manager. To reinforce shift left and to provide a practical and scalable way to establish content trust, we're working to simplify signing cloud native artifacts by adding cryo support for a six store, which includes signing and verifying artifacts in OpenShift. For the secret store CSI driver, we're working to add support for vaults and GCP secret providers and plan to GA the secret store CSI driver as well. On the conf confidential computing front, we continue to invest in adding support for confidential VMs and confidential containers in the cloud in conjunction with OpenShift Sandbox containers. Now, let me hand you to Radha to talk about networking and observability. Thanks, Jill. Lots of great features here. Let's talk about networking and observability. Next slide, please. All right, so first thing, we're going to talk about universal connectivity. This is a word or the name that is, we're using for a lot of enhancements and in-progress development that we're doing in the uh, Kubernetes networking space. And the main goal here is to uh, offer a more seamless experience with our networking stack, but also be more adaptable to external networks. So over the year, uh, you will see support for uh, the virtual routing and frameworking uh, Forwarding, sorry, uh, you will see support for subnet per namespace, uh, BGP, Ethernet, VPN protocols. But what is it actually good for? So we've been talking about virtualization here as one of the main topics. And if we've been using and then running some existing workloads on one of the traditional virtualization platforms, uh, or if you have some advanced networking use cases that you want to utilize within OpenShift and bring over into OpenShift, uh, this enhanced like segregation of security and flexible networking framework will allow you to do so. So you can focus directly on our application. You don't have to fiddle with the networking capabilities and you can just run your thing. So this is a really great feature and probably covers a lot of work done by multiple teams. Uh, our next feature on next slide is also interesting. Um, you've probably heard about eBPF before. And eBPF allows you to run small programs that run within the kernel space. So we've been using it for network monitoring, or we've been using it for node firewalling. It brings a lot of interesting features. Uh, but there are some challenges ar around that. And especially uh, when you have multiple uh, eBPF programs running on your cluster, you need to manage them somehow. So the BPF man uh, project or, or, or effort, BPF manager, 
is allowing you to administer uh, these BPF programs and build an ARBIC-like controls. So as an admin, you can restrict who's running these scripts, uh, what do they access, what kind of information they can use, uh, how do you load them, how do you modify them. Uh, it brings some file system management capabilities as well. And the whole idea is that it gives you more security and again, control around all these eBPF uh, hooks and all BPF, eBPF programs that you have on your cluster. Over the year, you will see our own eBPF implementation slowly adapting BPF Man. You will see Fedora 40, where BPF Man is already the default eBPF program manager, so you can already start playing with that. And in OpenShift 416, we'll have the first developer preview of BPF Man. So again, I'll look out for that, and you can try it out. But there are more networking features, so next slide, please. Uh, the uh, the next one, Gateway Kubernetes Gateway and API. Uh, this is a work that is built on top of the existing Kubernetes ingress resource that we have today in, in OpenShift, uh, but it offers more flexibility and scalability uh, by allowing developers and, and the admins to define custom routing, uh, custom traffic control, traffic management uh, capabilities and policies based on different things like traffic weighting and, and header-based matching. Uh, these kind of things allow basically to break your network API, networking into different layers. And then each layer can be assigned to a different role within your organization with different capabilities again. So it, it spreads the control and responsibilities for managing Kubernetes network across your teams. And again, it allows the teams and empowers the teams to do more modifications of certain things that they need for the applications. With that comes our second feature, and that's network observability, network observability operator, and the UI that is uh, that is shipped with that. Uh, today, uh, this is available with an OpenShift web console. It gives you a great interface, or where you see the networking traffic, the networking topology with your applications. We're actually bringing that experience uh, into the multi-cluster space, so you will find soon a similar thing, similar interface available with an ACM. Uh, we're enhancing that for additional type of metrics that you want to collect for specific use cases, uh, including the cluster edge objects and VIP object load balancers, these kind of things. So you will see more information uh, within the, the interfaces. And, and one of the cool things, and I'll be talking about it more in the observability space, is that we're doing a lot of analytics effort around the, uh, the data that we have. So you will see under some advanced capabilities for troubleshooting and really understanding what is happening, again, within the networking topology and with your applications. Next slide, please. So let's switch over to observability right now. And, and first thing I want to mention here real quick is what is the observability platform or, or set of features that we have here. We often talk about observability as multiple things at Red Hat. First, for us, it's a lot of building blocks that we offer to you for data collection, data storing, data delivering, and integrations within different products. So those are our foundation components in the observability space. But we're building a lot of analytic solutions on top of that to answer the questions of what is what is the problem on my cluster? Where do I focus today when I'm troubleshooting some issue? So you will see a lot of work that is on top of these different type of signals uh, that, again, we collect and, 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 and store and export. Uh, we also focus a lot on what we call the single pane of glass for observability. The idea is that we want to offer you a way how you enable the observability stack for different type of signals. It will give you some configurations, will give you some opinionated setup, how you run the observability stack for us, including the UIs, including the analytics features. But also, and I'll be talking about it too, uh, we're solution focused. We're looking at how observability can support different features and, and different products at Red Hat. We're building features directly in OpenShift that are based on the uh, telemetry and analytics data, but we also power different uh, use cases, would that be for telcos, for edge, and for others. And again, we'll touch on it in a bit. So when it comes to the foundation components, there are a couple of really interesting features that are coming up this year. First, uh, we're focused a lot on enabling our components with open telemetry and then introducing open telemetry to our stack. You've seen the first releases of open telemetry distribution, and I'll be showing you in a bit how the open telemetry collection for Edge and how that looks like. But we're even enhancing open telemetry with additional capabilities, additional receivers, and so on. 
Uh, you will also see open telemetry being integrated within our existing components. Uh, Locky and Vector, our logging stack, will get open telemetry exporters, so you can work with the, with the OP, OTLP standard. When it comes to logging, uh, there is an important thing that has been happening for a while right now, but we want to continue with that. We're slowly moving away from the elastic stack, stack into Locky and Vector. We're offering you more scalable and, and efficient components uh, for storing and processing your logs. And there'll be a lot of work and, and a lot of information provided to you when it comes to the migration again from the existing elastic components. Uh, for distributed tracing, we have the, the tempo storage uh, where uh, eventually this will be, uh, oh, sorry, the slides are back. Uh, this will be uh, no, no longer required. Uh, there would be a third party dependency will no longer be required. You don't need a third party storage to install uh, the tempo, tempo uh, project. Uh, the interesting thing uh, for me is the cluster observability operator. Again, this is our way how we'll allowing you to install a set of observability components on your cluster with some configurations. You will be able to choose different type of signals. It, it's integrated with our observability UI with the analytics features. It's already available as tech preview, so you can go ahead and start working with it. But again, this is our way how we'll telling you this is how you should run and install the open observability stack from OpenShift and from Red Hat. When it comes to visualization, uh, we're both focused both on the single cluster and multi-cluster experience. In single cluster, you will see a lot of features around including custom dashboards and adding dashboards specific to tracing, open telemetry, troubleshooting. I'll touch on it when we talk about analytics, but we're looking at signal correlation. We're looking at analytics features that we want to expose them to you. So in the troubleshooting specific side plane, you will see some of these correlations and some of these new features uh, that are building on top of all these signals. Uh, similar thing is happening in the multi-cluster space. Uh, we're leveraging the uh, ACM add-ons to build a similar experience where, again, you'll be able to choose the different type of signals that you want to use uh, for observability within ACM, and we'll give you our opinionated configuration, our setup, so you'll be able to almost immediately start using those things. Uh, we're enhancing also ACM with a new alerting UI that is similar to what you already have in OpenShift uh, Web Console. So the idea is that the UIs will be similar, but with ACM, you, of course, have the fleet level and account level management there as, as a thing. The analytics efforts, uh, super interesting. Uh, a lot of stuff is already happening there. You might have seen the correlator effort where we're correlating cluster events with logs and alerts. Uh, we're building on top of that. We'll be bringing additional features where we're trying to group alerts together, added additional scoring, additional ways how we visualize that. The goal here is to reduce the noise for you and, and make you focused on what is important on your cluster today so you can start triaging the issues on your cluster. Next slide, please. So super quick, uh, talking about uh, observability for Edge, I uh, already mentioned that one thing that we're doing is that we're focusing our solution for specific use cases. Uh, open telemetry is, is a great project. It allows us to be tech agnostic. It doesn't really matter whether you're using, whether you're using Prometheus, Jaeger, or something else. We can just scrape the data and, and work with that. Uh, the idea here is, is that uh, we are providing a very lightweight client uh, to the edge host. Uh, we can scrape specific type of data. Uh, we can uh, work with that story, visualize it again. I'm not going to go to too much details, but there's a great talk that happened on OpenShift Commons lately uh, for our friends from the ABB company. So you can look at how this setup actually looks like and what it does for our customer. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, one of the features that we have on the platform is something called Insights. It's, it's allowing us to look at uh, the analytics data that we collect from connected clusters and build interesting functionality on top of that. Uh, the two really interesting uh, services or, or features are both, uh, you can both find them on console.redhat.com slash OpenShift. Again, they're available to you once you install your cluster. Uh, the advisor service is providing you predictive and, and proactive recommendations for specific actions. There is a very cool feature that is being announced uh, within the days, but it's already available, uh, where uh, traditionally these recommendations were focused on infrastructure capabilities, uh, giving you, again, 
again, proactive recommendation of something potentially going wrong on your cluster. We've expanded that now, and it also supports workloads. So we can look at best practices for running different type of workloads. We can give you recommendations on security practices, on scalability things, and so on and so forth. Really cool. If you haven't seen the update risk feature that has been introduced, I believe, in November, uh, there's going to be more work around that. The update risk is a machine learning model that uh, analyzes the, the state of your cluster, compares it with the whole fleet, and gives you a set of blocking conditions or conditions where we do not recommend you to upgrade your cluster. Because of that, you should not be doing it. We're going to be adding additional views, so this information is more easy for you to find out. Cost management, another great service available on console Red Hat Com. It visualizes and distributes the cost of your OpenShift cluster and the workload, so you can see a cost per project. It's getting a lot of different capabilities when it comes to building a custom cost model. So you can add additional resources, external services. There's a lot of focus on supporting GPUs and GPU right sizing. Uh, you can also export the data to different places, Power BI, Excel. Uh, there's a resource optimization feature that is, uh, I believe, still dev preview, but it's, it's going to be prioritized soon. And the idea with resource optimization is that within the project cost, you'll be also able to see some potential optimization that you can make on with your workload with specific configuration that uh, you need to assign to your workload and specific impact on the actual cost of that workload. So it's pretty cool when it really comes to optimizing for the cost or optimizing for perfect use of your resources on your cluster. Next slide. Uh, this is my last slide. Uh, we've been talking a lot about uh, AI support, AI workloads, and, and AI-powered features. Uh, just want to mention here that observability and networking are both figuring out how to support these type of specific workloads. So we're doing a lot of work around GPU, HPU enablement on both on networking observability side, but also uh, for capabilities like resource optimizations that was mentioned. We're looking at capacity planning as another feature that we can introduce on top of that. We're looking at how we can instrument these specific tools and specific workloads uh, where you're building or hosting your AI and ML stuff. And this is where we are looking at, again, instrumentation and how to integrate these things, such as it feels like yet another workload, but it's really AI and ML capable uh, on your cluster. And together with the OpenShift Lightspeed team, we're also looking at how to simplify the problems and, and the networking complexity that is behind that, but also uh, how to figure out a connection between the recommendations and our own internal experience at Red Hat from running and hosting OpenShift into uh, a better explainability of what you see on the cluster and, and how you can, again, troubleshoot issues and, and work with your cluster. So we expect a lot of work in the light speed uh, space powered by the features that we're working on. Thanks a lot. And I'm handing over to show. All right, let's talk about multi-cluster. Next slide, please. All right, so starting off with Red Hat Advanced Cluster Management, we're continuing to level up our management game with a whole host of new features coming down the pipe across our cluster lifecycle, governance, observability, and disaster recovery areas. Kicking it off, we have our policy violation history. To date, you've only been able to get the present or real-time state of your policies across the fleet. We're working on enhancing this so that you're actually able to start storing the violation results of your policies for tracking and auditing purposes and just giving you some more tools to understand what's actually changing across your fleet. Next, we have progressive rollouts with policy. We know that changing any kind of configuration comes with the risk of introducing breaking changes across your environments. With progressive policy rollouts, you'll have much more fine-grained and systematic control with deploying or introducing uh, changes to your policies with some advanced controls that'll help put your mind at ease. And for application disaster recovery, we're collaborating with ODF Advanced. Um, and we're introducing the ability to bring the metro and regional DR capabilities to all of your applications, not just the ones you've deployed through GitOps with ACM. What that means for you is that you're going to have a much wider range of application DR support, even for OpenShift virtualization-based VM applications and ISV or ecosystem apps that you may have previously deployed. Next slide, please. And finally, we know that consistency and flexibility means meeting you wherever, anywhere, and everywhere you are, whether it's in the data center, in the cloud, or at the edge. And we're expanding our investment in all these areas. 
hopefully the slide will catch up. Um, so with managed OpenShift, it's finally happening. We are hard at work with creating cluster lifecycle capabilities for managing ROSA and ARO. You'll be able to provision, destroy, upgrade, and scale all of your managed OpenShift clusters from ACM and using GitOps-driven patterns. Perhaps you already have a lot of ROSA and ARO clusters. That's not going to be a problem. We're also going to be providing a streamlined import process to quickly onboard your existing managed OpenShift investment into ACM in a blink of an eye. At the edge, we're also looking to complete our lifecycle management story by providing the cluster lifecycle capabilities for Red Hat Device Edge, those microshift based clusters. And we're going to be improving our observability coverage for these edge clusters with the same features that you know in ACM already and much more. And finally, for hosted control planes, we know this was a game changing paradigm shift in how you deploy clusters with rapid provisioning times and cost savings on your infrastructure. We're working on deepening our investment into making management of hosted control planes even easier with further enhancements around observability and those crucial business continuity capabilities around migration and disaster recovery. That's all I have. I'm going to pass it over to Boaz to talk about Red Hat Advanced Cluster Security. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Joe. So I'll be uh, brief on ACS, and I'll actually skip this slide. Uh, there's a detailed ACS roadmap update that is available uh, elsewhere. So let's uh, start with next slide, please. And while the slide is updating, let me get started. On vulnerability management, we're planning these three important features. One is we've started to unify the image scanner across ACS and Quay. So this provides consistent reporting across the product. As part of this unification, Quay gained some features from ACS. ACS gained some features from Quay. We now support Golang and additional operating uh, system support. And we're ad adopting the OSV.dev uh, standard for language vulnerabilities. This really simplifies the way that we can address open source software where today every community is doing something different. And with OSV.dev, um, management is much simpler for you and for us, of course. Next is we're adding rem remediation uh, guidance. And this means that we will be able to update you and inform when Red Hat publishes updates for images, whether in the um, container catalog or OpenShift and Quay. And to do that, we're also adapting the adopting the CSAF VEX format, which uh, helps us better understand the impact of those vulnerabilities. Finally, we're going to be able to highlight when known exploits uh, of your vulnerabilities are present in your, in your images. Um, we've been talking about shift left. And for developers, we plan to be able to allow you to scan images from your local environment and so that you can push them safe images into your repository. And you can do that natively on your IDE or using the CLI. Moving on to compliance, as some of you may have noticed, in 4.4, we already started shipping compliance 2.0. And this is a major overhaul for compliance. We're building in the compliance operator. So you can configure, schedule, run compliance operator right from within ACS. You can review and export the compliance operator scan results, build tailor profiles, and get remediation. And as part of this, we're also updating uh, the benchmarks. Some of the benchmarks, starting with OpenShift profiles for PCI DSS 4.0 and CAS OpenShift uh, 1.5. And on the topic of SBOM, so for bill of materials, you know, once an SBOM is generated, it's really important to be able to map those components to known vulnerabilities, to evaluate how secure your software is coming into your supply chain or coming out of it. And so we're going to allow a two way mapping. You'll be able to import SBOMs. And you'll be able to generate SBOMs from your image, images and export them. And in both ways, you'll be able then to map vulnerabilities to SBOMs. Next slide, please. On policy as code, we plan to simplify the way that customers can manage ACS policies with a GitOps approach, where the source of truth is a GitOp, you know, a Git repository as opposed to the ACS database. This, you can do this today with 
import and export, but users are telling us that they prefer to use declarative Kubernetes resources over API calls to ACS. So we will make these workflows possible using the declarative approach, and we'll provide examples of how to manage uh, ACS policies using Argo CD and other GitOps tools. On the deployment risk model, users are telling us they, they like this, but they want more visibility and be able to customize the risk formula to their needs. And so that's exactly what we're planning to do. And so users can understand why one item is ranked higher than another and adjust the ranking to their own risk definitions. On the network graph, as you, again, you may have seen, we started shipping this is, uh, in 4.4. In You'll be able to better distinguish how traffic is coming out of your cluster and whether this, this traffic is going between your secured clusters or whether it's going completely outside to external IP. Uh, today, we don't distinguish it, but we plan to be able to provide that, um, that information correctly. With scope runtime analysis, ACS runtime analysis can be resource intensive and some users don't necessarily want to run it everywhere all of the time. So we plan to give users the choice of limiting some runtime features to specific namespaces, as well as turning these features on and off to fit their needs. Next slide, please. On uh, multi-tenancy and seamless integration extended platform support, uh, there's a lot on this slide. I know I'll just, I just want to highlight a couple. Uh, I want to call out short-lived tokens for machine-to-machine -machine access. This is something that has been called out by many customers. This flagged, you know, long-lived API tokens are flagged as being less secure correctly. So, and so ACS will provide short-lived access tokens for machine access, starting with support for GitHub Actions, followed by Tekton pipelines. And we welcome use cases from customers for their machine-to-machine -machine access requirements for further support. Let us know. And the other topic I want to call out is mapping of ACS and OpenShift RBAC. Um, users want to manage ACS permissions for roles that already exist in their OpenShift or Kubernetes environment. They may want to add namespace admins, application developers, other DevSecOps users into the ACS console. And so we're planning to provide a direct mapping of RBAC from secured clusters in order to eliminate this effort of manually creating and then managing uh, duplicate roles. And that's it for ACS and move on to you, Harry. Thank you both. Um, I will talk about uh, Telco and Edge. Next slide, please. Uh, I mean, we are extending our edge capabilities to other domains, you know, such as industrial, retail, public defense, edge computing. And I will start with MicroShift, right? MicroShift is a small form factor Kubernetes distributions uh, where we are targeting, you know, field deployment edge devices, you know, with, with as little as two cores and two gigabit of RAM. In the upcoming 12 months, we intend to focus on compliance topics such as ISA 62443, which is an important security standard in the uh, industrial space. Another big topic here as well is consistent management across the fleet. And we are working you know, on the integrations with our management capabilities of Ansible automation platforms, advanced cluster management, and advanced cluster security. Uh, to enhance networking experience, uh, we plan to add support for Maltus and IPv6. And last but not least, we investigate the support of uh, low latency workload on those uh, uh, Edge and Microsoft uh, Microsoft devices. Next slide, please. Uh, so far, I mean, uh, another frequent used options for edge deployment is single node OpenShift. This is typically the case, you know, in the 5G uh, uh, run use cases, right? Uh, we continue our trajectory here of reducing control plane resource usage to be able to fit, you know, more room for workloads. The major focus as well next year is will be on the uh, faster edge rollout to minimize time for installations, upgrade, rollback, and break fix. Let's see on the next slide, you know, how we plan to, to do so. 
In uh, we recently in February we delivered you know image based upgrade for uh, as a dev preview for single node OpenShift. We are maturing that technology and we'll also be extended you know our image based methodology for new deployment. Uh, we will deliver image based install technology as a developer preview in OCP 16. Uh, this methodology allows, you know, edge user to shift left much of the installations process so that once a server will be at the far edge, it can be provisioned and enter service in a very short time. Next slide, please. Uh, continuing with your initiative to improve, you know, operational KPIs for single node OpenShift, we want to address the uh, need for rapid restoration of services when a server has catastrophic failure at the far edge. In this scenario, where the original hardware is inoperable, a new server is shipped to the far edge site and the operator then wants you know, to get the software back to the state it was in as fast as possible prior to the hardware failure. Uh, Red Hat will develop an image-based break fix solutions where we will allow you well, we'll give you the means, you know, to do regular backups of the CNF data when in service. And then when the replacement server is delivered to all sites, restore both the OpenShift configuration as well as the CNF configurations so that the node can come back online, you know, and service can be restored in short order. This would require, of course, you know, some capabilities as well at the CNF level to fully leverage the functionality. Next slide, please. As far as Oran, we continue our, uh, and I will wait for the slide to catch up, but I will start talking about it. Um, as far as Oran, you know, we aim to continue our journey by promoting an intent-based API and the Kubernetes declarative paradigms. In the upcoming month, we will drive sustainability by convincing you know the Oran community to adopt energy consumptions metric for network functions based on Kepler projects. Additionally, we will work on reference or cloud deployment under the Oran software community. Further to align you know the O2 IMS interface, we have embarked on the implementations of the O2 IMS inventory and monitoring API and we'll gradually add Oran features to our roadmaps when API specifications are available. Last but not least, we wish to focus as well, you know, on partnering with hardware vendors and NEPs to deliver a pre-integrated or cloud and cloud run that will address, you know, the main market challenges like operational efficiency and time to market. Next slide, please. So far, we talked about run and edge. Now let's take a look, you know, at multi-node cluster features. Uh, this one is applicable, you know, not only for the telco space, but it can be used, you know, for any uh, type of deployment. As of today, a pod is scheduled on a node where there will be enough CPUs and memory. But what about network bandwidth? Assuming, for example, you know, that some pod can consume, you know, more than 10 gigs, what if we schedule three of them on the same only 25 gigs of capacity, right? In order to avoid such issue of network bandwidth over commitment and also to efficiently uh, schedule pod on a cluster, you know, based on the um, on their network bandwidth consumptions, ideally one would need, you know, to enhance Kubernetes to consider network bandwidth as a schedule, schedulable entity, you know, similar to what is done, you know, for CPU and memory. The solution I'm um, I'm about to talk here does not, you know, require any announcement at the uh, scheduler, but it leverages, you know, some of the existing functionality uh, in Kubernetes already, right? So we already have a support of solutions based on Kubernetes extended resources with no changes to the scheduler, but requiring today a lot of manual configuration from the cluster administrator. What we are doing is we are trying to optimize that and to do some automations, you know, around that configurations to drastically simplify the configurations while promoting the use of these features among CNF vendors. 
Uh, that's all I had for uh, Telco and Edge. And now I think we, we move to the OpenShift command gathering, where I would just like to remind you about OpenShift commons event at Red Hat Summit in Denver next week, uh, next month. So sorry. Do not forget to join OpenShift commons, where you and other OpenShift users and partners come together to collaborate and share experiences. And we will give you as well, you know, some insight on into roadmaps and new development. And I think the last slide is the closing one where I just would like, you know, to thank you for, uh, to thank you everyone for joining to today. And I would like to remind you that the uh, What's New and One Next sessions are published and publicly available. Feel free to check, you know, on those new features at learn.openshift.com or try.openshift.com. Thank you again. And we look forward to seeing you, some of you at the Red Hat Summit in Denver next month. Thank you. And have a fantastic day.